when moving air meets water, friction develops. This energy causes movement of the water molecules. During storms, waves can reach up to 70 feet in height. Seamen have been telling stories about 120 foot high monster waves for a long time, but scientists dismiss these stories as yarns. However, we know now that they really do exist. Freak waves, the monsters of the sea. Rotterdam, the biggest port in the world. Intense activity prevails here in the container terminal, even at midnight. Captain Karl Ulrich Lampe, on his way to work. He has had more experience with the power of waves than he could ever want. There are still 400 containers to be loaded on board the freight ship Angela J. The 65-year-old captain could have retired long ago, but he was once again persuaded by the shipping company to take command of the freighter. Time to set sail. The sailors take to the gangways and the hawsers. Captain Lampe commands a 10-man crew, coming from six different countries. 4,700 tons begin to move. The ship's destination is on the other side of the Atlantic. After 20 miles, when the Angela J reaches the open sea, the sun begins to rise. Carl Ulrich Lampe has been at sea for almost 50 years. Weather and visibility are good as the ship crosses the English Channel. Nevertheless, the second mate on the bridge registers each and every movement around the ship. When the sea is calm, there is enough time for a chat on the bridge with the second mate, who comes from Poland. Have you heard anything about freak waves? No, 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 no I've never no? heard anything about They that. happen quite often yeah. and they, they measured waves up to a height of almost 30 meters. It's a huge and, wave. Uh, yes, and it's interesting what the, uh, the theory, how they develop, you know? Waves move with different speed. Yes. So one wave overtakes the other one. They approach each other with different angles and suddenly the energy of two waves adds each yes, other yes, and then they build up. Storms can cause massive waves to swell. But until recently, scientists were convinced that waves of more than 80 feet in height were physically impossible. During experiments, scientists acted on the assumption that wave motion remains constant. But the wind causes waves to move irregularly, and different waves of varying speeds overlap one another. When a number of large waves meet at a particular point, monster waves of up to 140 feet can be generated. And then they have this phenomenon, sometimes it's one big wave or, Very speed. Very or three, well, called the three sisters. Have you ever seen this? Yes, once wave? in my life. Yeah. And, and, and so far I never believed it, I must say. Afternoon on the English Channel, a wind begins to blow. Evening draws near as the coast of Ireland appears on the horizon. Fast net rock, 
the most southwesterly lighthouse before the Irish coast. Here, the winter storms, which strike every year, see to it that stories of giant waves will never be forgotten. Saturday evening in the fishing village of Baltimore. Every two weeks after their routine drill, the lifeboat men meet up for a chat and a pint of Guinness in Bush's pub. The captain of the lifeboat, Kieran Cotter, is an assorted goods salesman by profession. Today he commanded an alarm drill, and this time it is quite possible that it will prove useful. A storm is forecast for tomorrow. The next morning, all is quiet on land. But out at Fastnet Rock, the storm is already raging. Although the lighthouse tower is 180 feet high, the waves almost reach the top. The waves crashing against the cliffs of Misenhead provide an impressive spectacle. It is the 3rd of January. In the afternoon, the storm has already caused substantial waves to form. Dietrich Wesel and his longtime girlfriend, Ute Junge, are on holiday here from Germany. The marine biologist is a passionate hobby photographer and does not want to miss this unique opportunity. Three hours ago, the storm changed course, coming from the northwest. Two different waves crash into each other, the sea boils, and time and again unimaginably high waves are formed. Dietrich Verzel and his girlfriend discover an old concrete stairway that leads to the cliffs. The storm is too rough for Uta Junge, so she decides to stop and wait. The hobby photographer goes down a few more steps and stops a good 90 feet above the waterline. The waves make for breathtaking subjects. But then, a muffled rumbling noise becomes unusually loud, even during this rough storm. The wave is a good 90 feet high and the photographer has no chance. Dietrich Verzel fights for his life. The place where he stood is empty. Realizing that she herself cannot do a thing, Dietrich Verzel's girlfriend runs off to find help. In the raging sea, it is almost impossible to find a rock to cling to. Yet another wave nearly reaches the spot where Dietrich Verzel stood not even two minutes ago. The lifeboat men in Baltimore assemble hastily. Kieran Cotter knows he doesn't have much time. It takes half an hour through the high waves to get to Misenhead. 
If the man is not found within a further half hour, then he doesn't even stand a chance of surviving the water temperature. This time, Captain Cotter does not take it easy on the engine of his boat. Before they reach the cliffs of Misenhead, the search operation is coordinated with the rescue team on land. The men immediately take up their lookout positions. The storm and waves have decreased in strength, but there is no trace of the missing man. And the half hour has long since passed. After two hours, Captain Cotter decides to break off the search and to return to Baltimore before dark. He knows that Dietrich Verzel will no longer be found alive. Eleven days later, Seals circle around a lifeless body. Seals instinctively try to protect helpless creatures by doing this. The body of Dietrich Verzel is found by the Coast Guards. The rocks have decapitated him. Dietrich Verzel is not an isolated case. Every year, people are swept away by giant waves off the coast of Ireland. Meanwhile, far out in the Atlantic, the Angela J continues her journey. Captain Lampe sets course for Newfoundland. In the meantime, Mareko Zislav prepares lunch. The cook has made quite a name for himself with his Polish specialties. Mealtimes are sacred on board. is glorious. Nevertheless, Captain Lampe goes up to the bridge. He is mistrustful of the sea's calmness. Uh, did you see the last vessel report? Yes, I saw. Unfortunately, it became to be a little bit worse than now. So as you can see now, it's about five degrees in Buffalo scale, and later on in the evening will be about even eight degrees in Buffalo scale. I mean, today evening will be a little bit more rolling than now. Yeah. Well, okay. We have to live with that. Wind force eight means a gale warning. Not a big problem for a ship like the Angela J. But memories haunt Captain Lampe. In March 2001, when he left the Falkland Islands on the passenger ship Caledonian Star, a wind force of eight was also forecast. Yet much worse was in store. Well, uh, we see this is the morning of the 2nd of March, when we were already in the, uh, in the, in the storm. We see the weather forecast was entirely wrong. We already had wind force 12, that means 60 knots of wind or even more, 80 knots of wind. We were down to minimum speed, heading into the sea and uh, try to keep the ship as steady as possible under these uh, circumstances. 
the 330-foot-long passenger ship battled through the ever-rising waves. Of course, the sea was building up all the time, and uh, at this moment, at this time, the sea was approximately between 40 and 50 feet in average. Well, of course, with the, uh, with the time being when uh, and the wind speed increased steadily, the sea was building up more and more, and uh, it became more difficult to maneuver, to, to keep the ship steady on this course. The ship was pitching and rolling heavily, um, and for this reason we had asked all our passengers to remain in their cabins, best stay in their bunks. The crew members were on standby in the elevates for, uh, and looked after the passengers and served uh, food or drinks on uh, request. And uh, of course the deck crew was on standby all the time. The outer decks were closed. At uh, about quarter past five I had left the bridge um, and went down to my uh, quarters and uh, 50 minutes later we were, uh, the ship was hit by three of these very big waves, what we now say freak waves and um, um, as the chief mate who was on watch at that time told me he, he saw the waves about in a distance of one nautical mile uh, on starboard bow and uh, while well, he altered course slightly to starboard to have a better angle when meeting the waves because there was no way to avoid them. The ship took the first wave pretty good. Second wave was already very, very difficult and after the third, uh, second wave the, the ship just fell down into a trough and was hidden by the third wave when tons of water was just smashing to the, down to the ship. I was in my cabin and uh, when the first uh, wave hit the ship I was thrown into my shower cabin and of course uh, tried to get up as fast as possible and uh, to rush to the bridge, back to the bridge and uh, when I passed my uh, quarters, the water was already pouring out of the uh, ceiling. I was really scared and I thought we were, the uh, ship was going down already. When I arrived in, in the wheelhouse on the bridge, the bridge was filled about uh, three to four feet with water. Uh, the entire bridge uh, crew was swimming and cold uh, seawater and uh, they had to open the, uh, the sliding doors to both sides to the bridge wings uh, to, to uh, let the water out of the bridge. The rest fled it down to the officers quarters and uh, when I arrived okay there was hardly any water left on the bridge but the entire bridge uh, equipment was destroyed and it really looked, looked very messy. The entire electronic electrical equipment has been uh, was out of order. Short circuits everywhere, flash, uh, flashing lights. The alarm bells were ringing because of the short circuit. And uh, starboard bridge wing was uh, well severely damaged, out of order. So there was quite some damage, but mm, uh, fortunately we never lost engine power, steering power, so that we, we could control the ship and then just keep the ship steady as good as possible and wait for weather improvement.
After a few hours, the gale began to die down. The Caledonian star had withstood three freak waves of over 100 feet in height. Damaged certainly, but without any casualties. Back on board the Angela J, the storm begins to blow. Well, who wants to put it on? A fitting time for the weekly safety training exercise. Thick neoprene suits serve to enable the seamen to survive in cold water. Of course, if there is a possibility, we can help each other like this, yeah? We have to put one hand here, another our nose, and the second one like this. And jump into the water feet first. Captain Lampe knows that not many ships are so lucky as to withstand a freak wave like the Caledonian Star. The hold is quickly checked to make sure all of the containers are properly secured. As the first officer takes over the helm, Captain Lampe immerses himself in the records he has collected about freak waves since his dramatic encounter. He knows that these monsters of the sea must first be understood before seafaring can be safe again. Oil drilling platforms are also threatened by freak waves. 600 such huge platforms dot the world's oceans. One of them is the Petrobras 23 located 90 miles off the coast of Brazil in the South Atlantic. The first freak wave ever recorded and measured hit an oil platform like this in 1995. Sensors which monitor every movement of the water with laser beams recorded a wave that peaked at a height of 94 feet. The floating city of steel buzzes with activity. The Christmas tree is being prepared for its 6,500-foot journey to the bottom of the sea. A container with spare parts is unloaded from the supply boat. The men on board the Petrobras 23 searched the ocean floor for four months and finally found what they were looking for. The Christmas tree's pumps and valves will control the supply of compressed air and the pumping of oil from the ocean floor. Just a few years ago, it was all dangerous manual work. Today, computers have taken over. The drill master controls every movement from his little glass cabin with a joystick. It is very precise work. The tiniest deviation above could make a huge difference 6,500 feet below. On the bridge, six marine propellers steer the ship against winds and currents and keep the floating hulk's pontoon in exactly the same place. In case of an emergency, the 80 technicians could leave the platform with boats in the space of a few minutes. And even 90 feet up, the portholes are secured from the inside with steel doors.
An engineer monitors the computer that pumps water into or out of the pontoons in order to keep the platform level. The final touches are added to the Christmas tree. The work on board an oil platform is very demanding, even when the sea is calm. But when winter storms strike, it becomes a dramatic challenge. February 1982. The oil platform Ocean Ranger, off the coast of Canada, is caught in a storm. The Ocean Ranger's 15,000 tons of weight float on two massive pontoon bodies, which are filled with air. Like a submarine, ballast water is pumped into or out of the pontoon's individual chambers, using pumps and valves. In this way, the platform is kept steady on the surface of the water. On the Ocean Ranger, the control room for operating the valves and water pumps is located in one of the artificial island's pillars. Donald Rathbun is experienced in operating the ballast water pumps. Winter storms are nothing new off the coast of Newfoundland. The steel doors in front of the portholes remain open. February 14th, 7.55 p.m a giant wave strikes. The salt water causes a series of short circuits. Donald Rathbun no longer has any control. Pumps and valves switch themselves on. As if by magic, the portholes deep down in the pontoons open. Water gushes in, and the Ocean Ranger begins to list dangerously. At 1.09 a.m., an emergency call is placed, but because of the storm, the rescue helicopters are unable to take off. And they can't find a problem. Pardon me? They can't find a problem. No, they're trying to, trying to isolate it. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're sure to bind you now. Yeah. A list of 15 degrees and waves 70 feet high. Water gushes into the pillars. The men on board the Ocean Ranger begin to realize how serious the situation is. Most of them had been in their cabins up till now. There is very little time left. were the last words ever heard from the Ocean Ranger. At 3.38 a.m., the Ocean Ranger disappears off the radar screens. When the helicopters finally are cleared for takeoff, a dramatic rescue operation begins. There is no sign of the huge platform and the 84 men who work on it. The wreckages of lifeboats testify to a desperate fight for survival. Equipped with underwater boats and divers, the Coast Guard crew sets out to find the Ocean Ranger and the cause of the catastrophe. 250 feet below, they discover the wreckage of the Ocean Ranger. Again, we appear to be looking at a lot of electrical equipment, uh, transformers. Uh, 
Uh, this appears to be uh, off the top of the uh, one of the cranes. Again, we're looking at uh, curtain believed to be out of accommodation uh, around uh, a bed. And eventually, they find the control room and the porthole where the disaster originated. At, uh, the metal door being closed over the uh, glass window. The uh, glass on this uh, porthole number one uh, is broken. Uh, we can see it glittering around the edges. First, the glass broke, and then the steel safety door behind it closed. Divers force their way inside the control room. The position of the switches reveals to the experts what happened. The effort to pump water out of the pontoons only accelerated the disaster because the valves did exactly the opposite as a result of the short. 84 people lost their lives on the Ocean Ranger. Since the existence of monster waves has been proven, a lot of research has been done into their causes. Freak waves occur mostly when the wind puts pressure against a strong ocean current, when the depth of the ocean changes dramatically, and when two storms that are close to each other lead to the overlapping of waves. In the beginning, they were believed to be very rare, but now scientists know freak waves occur during almost every big storm. When ships are no longer maneuverable, normal waves are dangerous enough. But monster waves of 100 feet in height or higher can cause large freight ships to simply break into pieces. October 2000. A massive wave damages the bow of the Evely Sun so badly that the tanker ship sinks. The 14 crew members are rescued by helicopters. When a freak wave hits the hull of a ship, the pressure amounts to 100 tons per one single square meter. December 1999. The tanker ship Erica gets caught in a storm off the coast of Brittany. The hull breaks after the impact of a huge wave. In the meantime, researchers have been investigating shipwrecks from the last few decades, whose cause for sinking remains unclear. The result is alarming. In the last 20 years alone, 200 large ships and one drilling platform have sunk as a result of giant waves. Scientists have now begun to carry out large research projects with the aim of making seafaring safer again. It is important to understand the origins of monster waves in order to improve forecasting systems. Wolfgang Rosenthal is the coordinator of the EU research project MaxWave. For three years he studied all of the data collected about monster waves from around the world. Now here on the North German island of Silt he is testing a new kind of radar, which is capable of identifying the exact height of waves from a long distance. With the use of such radar machines, ships can at least be warned of a collision with a monster wave a few minutes in advance. The new machines are still undergoing tests, but the results so far are encouraging. The wave radar machine is also expected to be very helpful in researching the chaotic formation of waves in nature. This is what you see on a typical radar screen if you take an image uh, with a photograph, for instance. To measure sea state to measure waves um, and wave heights with from such a sensor 
you need to remove all the noise. And this is done in the left-hand picture. There you see large wave crests and valleys. The wave crests are depicted by dark colors, uh, valleys by light colors. And you see here um, what you can also measure in terms of wave height that are long crested ocean waves that uh, run from, in this case, north towards south. And uh, we use it to measure individual wave heights, individual uh, crest to trough differences. However, the monster waves can be detected not only from land and sea. For three weeks, the satellites ERS-1 and ERS-2 circled the world's oceans, shooting 34,000 pictures. A map of the world was put together, recording all the wave heights. Ten monsters reaching a height of 90 feet and three others reaching 110 feet were recorded. In just three weeks, a frightening result. Nobody ever imagined that freak waves occur so often. Of the 39,000 cargo ships that sail the world's oceans every year, 200 of them sink. Shipping companies now face further problems. Insurance companies are demanding better precautions on board ships. Modern electronic equipment in particular has been proven to be very vulnerable when it comes in contact with large amounts of salt water. If the engines cut out, the ship can no longer be steered and is absolutely helpless in a storm. With this knowledge in mind, each and every rule and regulation for shipbuilding is being reconsidered. Electronic equipment needs to be protected from above, from water leakage caused by a huge wave striking the bridge. Captain Lampe knows that this newly acquired knowledge about the danger of freak waves will change the face of shipbuilding. A shipyard in Flensburg, Germany. The newly acquired knowledge about the power of monster waves is already being applied to the construction of this ferry boat. 10,000 tons of steel are shaped into a body, 720 feet long, 97 feet wide. The welding seams and the strutting need to be more stable. The bow needs to be built much stronger in order to withstand the impact of masses of water. To date, the ship sides have been far too thin. One single wave could break the hull in two. But now some additional millimeters of steel let the hull withstand the freak waves. Shipbuilders and wave researchers are also demanding that the cross beams on the inside of the ship be constructed more stably. Here, in the Department of Ship Design and Information Technology at the Technical University of Hamburg-Harburg, scientists estimate the enormous powers which result when a giant wave strikes the bow of a large ship and threatens either to capsize it or to tear it asunder. Some ship types are very vulnerable to special phenomena related to a sea state problems such as parametric rolling or pure loss on a wave crest. clearly distinguish and say uh, there are some types of ships uh, where the IMO limits seem to be not uh, okay, where they should be increased, and there are some ship types which uh, seem not to have any problems. During simulations with massive waves, half of the 150 existing ships, none of which was older than five years, had capsized. Only the ships with higher bows proved to be more stable. You have to uh, maximize the stability when the ship is in a situation where the wave uh, crest is at the middle of the ship because then she loses most of the stability because the aft ends of the ship uh, are not submerged. And you can do so by, on one hand, try to trim the vessel extremely by stern if she's in the wave crest position 
And on the other hand, if you want to have more stability, you have to force the ship to immerse it further on the crest and you can do that by a well-rounded main section. The Adriatic coast of Montenegro. Peter Markovic suffered the consequences of the simple lack of knowledge seafarers had until recently. He had only been a seaman for six months when he set sail from Rotterdam on the Flare, a 650-foot-long freight ship. At 3 a.m. on December 30, 1997, we set sail for Canada from the harbour of Rotterdam, without being given a specific destination. A few days later we were told that it would be Montreal. There we were supposed to pick up grain that was destined for Saudi Arabia. At the Danish Hydraulic Institute, the newly acquired knowledge is made use of during tests on ship models. The model is that of a modern tanker ship, like the hundreds which sail the seas every day, on a scale of 1 to 100. To date, tests performed on the bows of ships were carried out using regular waves, which of course do not occur in reality. Now, it is possible to simulate the chaos caused by real waves. These waves correspond to real 43-foot-high storm waves. That is how high the waves were when the flare, with the inexperienced seaman Peter Makovic on board, got caught in a winter storm. The ship was swaying heavily, and I was standing there, staring into the sea. Then the enormous wave struck a second time. I was really frightened, so I went to the mate's parlor. That's where the first mate and the captain of the ship, the Greek man Spiros, were. I think the ship's spark was there too. I said to the captain in Serbian, we're going to break in two, and he just laughed. Everyone laughed. I was ashamed. I was an inexperienced seaman and I was really embarrassed. Researchers simulate the formation of a freak wave. Waves come from two directions and meet in the middle of the basin. 43-foot-high waves suddenly mutate into 72-foot-high monsters. I was frightened, so I got the survival suit and the proper footwear ready, so that I would have the necessary equipment in case of an emergency, although at that time I didn't really know what was going to happen. I practiced and practiced until it didn't take me more than 30 seconds to put on the survival gear. The freight ship battled against the rough waters for six days. The captain reduced the speed to three knots in order to lessen the impact of the waves. The ship was acting really crazily during those waves. The whole thing was shaking, and it felt like everything was going to break into pieces. The fittings, the walls, the cupboards, everything. January 16, 1998, 4.30 a.m. No one could see it, but they could feel it. A freak wave struck the MV flare.
i Dragan i ja se okrećemo i bježimo svak na svoju stranu. Dragan and I turned around and we both ran in different directions. He to his cabin, I to mine. It was such a shock. I could hardly believe it. From my cabin, I could hear the siren screaming. That means everyone off the ship. It was such a shock. Your heart and soul just ripped to shreds. Peter Makovic managed to pull on his survival suit. Other seamen fled to the lifeboats without safety gear. I could see a ship about 70 or 80 feet ahead of me. I was so happy, happy under the circumstances, although I was in a state of shock, without feelings. I was happy because I thought that some ship had come to save us, and I thought to myself, we're in luck. But as the silhouette of the approaching ship became clearer, I realized that it was the front side of our own ship. I recognized our ship's crane, that is to say, the front part of our ship, was floating around in the water. The life raft either fell down or Jimmy managed to free it from the mooring, and it was floating in the water next to the rear end of the ship, where we were. As I was looking at it, a wave flipped it over, just like a hand would flip it over, like a bowl being turned over. The next morning, the tanker ship, Stolt Aspiration, arrived at the scene of the wreck. The rear of the flare had sunk quickly, but the bulkheads in the bow had held. Peter Makovic and three comrades were floating somewhere on the overturned life raft. When I was on that raft, I was overcome by a sense of panic, a sort of obsession. I wanted them to find me dead there. I didn't want to be missing forever. It became a real burden. I couldn't stay in touch with reality. Those are the kind of thoughts that would be completely absurd in any normal situation, but I became obsessed with the idea of being dead and not missing. At 2.23 p.m., the Canadian Air Force rescue helicopter, R-304, discovered the overturned life raft. At that moment, Filipino, who was next to me, woke me from either sleep or a state of shock, but I think it was more like sleep, and he pointed in a direction. And I saw a helicopter, about 350 or 400 feet away. I couldn't tell exactly. I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. It's a joy that you can't describe. Then I thought at that moment, uh-oh, a mirage. And I asked Filipino to shake me, to slap me, but he just kept pointing in the other direction. And I saw a plane flying at low altitude, looking for us. At 2.34 p.m., Peter Makovic was pulled from the water by the Canadian Air Force. With him, three other survivors. The safety suits had prevented them from freezing to death. The other 21 crew members from the freight ship Flare, however, were not so lucky. As the Angela J approaches the Canadian coast, the weather is glorious and the water calm. Now should be about five to six degree in Beaufort scale. Now, you, as you can see, now is not more than three, and the swell about not more than two meters high. So the prediction was was wrong. I, think. I agree, absolutely. I mean, and they, they predicted, I think, six meters uh, sea uh, here in the area, and uh, I can't see anything like that. So, again, uh, it seems to be really difficult to, uh, to predict a, uh, the weather or make a, a rather reliable weather forecast, don't you think so? Yes, uh, they simply don't know what will be the later. 
but anyway we are fortunate the weather is better than expected and so I think our speed is pretty good in the moment and so uh, I think uh, we can be at the uh, pilot station tomorrow morning 9 o'clock is that yes so yeah. that's correct tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock we'll be yeah. at the pilot station well wow, that's pretty good yeah Carl Ulrich Lampe is aware of the fact that people are beginning to understand the origins of the freak waves that for so long were deemed impossible. And they can build their ships better to withstand the giant waves. But they will never really be able to forecast them precisely. The monsters of the sea.